Okay, welcome everyone. This is Lisa Edinburgh, Chair of the Westboro School Committee. Today is Wednesday, November 30th. This meeting of the Westboro School Committee is called to order. Please stand if you are able for the Pledge of Allegiance. Could be the rain we're hearing. So thank you for joining us this evening. I'd like to notify everyone in the room with us tonight that this meeting is being recorded and live streamed by Westboro TV. School committee meetings are available for remote viewing or listening on Westboro TV's government channels Verizon 28 and Charter 192 and online on the Westboro TV YouTube channel. Thank you to Westboro TV for covering the broadcast this evening. We have with us tonight Superintendent Amber Bach, Assistant Superintendent Dr. Daniel Mayer, Director of Finance and Administration David Gordon, Vice Chair of the Westboro School Committee Steve Durrett, School Committee members Raghu Nandan, Kristen Vincent, and Steve Batchelor. Our student representative, Robert Chika Ghosh, was not, was not able to be with us this evening. Also with us is Recording Secretary Jen staff from Westboro TV here, and I'd like to personally welcome everyone sitting in front of us and those watching from home. Our agenda this evening is as follows. We'll begin with an approval of minutes from November 16, 2022, regular session meeting. Then we'll move to the superintendent's report, followed by the assistant superintendent's report. Then we'll hear the director of, from the director of finance administration's report, and if after this report it is 6.15 exactly, we will enter into a public budget hearing, which includes the FY24 budget presentation with the superintendent's final recommendation, plus a discussion from the school committee and potentially we will hear from residents. We will then continue the meeting with the school committee member reports, followed by the building project updates. We'll then potentially hear from some citizens' requests, uh, if anyone is here for that, followed by the capital planning update, then a discussion about a subcommittee on school committee policies, and then we'll continue with a battery storage proposal for Fales Elementary School, and then adjourn for this evening. So we'll begin with an approval of minutes. Do we have a motion to approve the minutes from November 16th, 2022 regular session? So moved. Do we have a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Okay. That's a five to zero vote, five being present. And we'll move on to the next agenda item. With the superintendent's report. Thank Amber? you, good to see everybody. I actually don't have much to report tonight regarding highlights. It's been a short week and with it having been a holiday weekend, um, you know, so it's been pretty uh, quick. We've just been working on budget. So I'll save the vast majority of my updates for uh, when we turn towards that discussion tonight. Okay, uh, Daniel. Good evening, I'll give you one uh, update on, <clears throat> you may recall that we're doing a English language arts review curriculum review this year and I just wanted to let you know um, um, that that we had a meeting today we were meeting monthly there's about 45 faculty members and administrators who are involved um, it's kindergarten through grade 12 it's a uh, terrific group that um, has come together to basically look as we periodically do and um, at our curriculum and say where are we strong where can we be stronger um, and so at this stage and we're three meetings in on our work we've been focusing on writing thus far and we have preliminary recommendations that we're starting to formulate on writing they're going to move over to reading um, our anti we anticipate by late May giving you a report but I just wanted to you know keep you abreast that that's that's a a fully you know engaged very active discussion that's happening um, so I'm proud of the work that we're doing thus far and I look forward to you know finally like at, towards the end of the year giving you the, a formal report on it that's pretty exciting to hear that 45 staff members are involved with this process which we yes. hear a lot when there's been a, a review of curriculum that we have over 40 50 teachers and 
leadership team together yeah. making progress on that's great evaluating and making recommendations yeah and it's a it's a nice assortment of all grade levels and also like special needs teachers ell teachers you know ad school administrators assistant principal or principal yeah so it's a great group thank you Okay, Dave, do you have anything for this evening? Um, no, um, no updates from me specifically. I, uh, like Superintendent Bach, I will save my updates for the budget presentation. Okay, so we are a little bit ahead of our 615 uh, budget hearing. Um, so I'm going to move on to, I think I'm going to move on to our last item on our agenda, which is the battery storage proposal for fail school. Because I think that will be a, a 10 minute or less. <laughs> or less. Okay. <coughs> Good evening. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I introduced to the school committee a proposal that I sought on behalf of the school committee in regards to the issue of uh, demand charges based on the fact that we have nearly 100% uh, energy. Actually, we have excess energy from the solar uh, panel system that we have. It fails. The issue, however, is because when the sun isn't shining, uh, we rely on the uh, utility grid to supply whatever the building needs, which is not a lot of power. But on the other hand, because we are uh, considered a commercial entity, uh, we get charged uh, called the demand charge associated with that energy, uh, which is what the utility is required to supply, uh, whether or not we take that energy or not. So. Uh, as I mentioned before, the monthly bills relative to demand charge are somewhere between $1,500 and $3,000 a month. And obviously, if we could avoid that, um, it would be a good thing. So early on in the project, realizing that, in fact, demand charges would eventually occur, uh, I had talked to the designer of the system that's there, and that's Solar Design Associates out of Harvard, Mass., <clears throat> who are not only um, the designer for our system, but for others, other school systems in the Commonwealth. So the, the process as to how we can avoid the demand charge is to store some of our energy uh, in batteries overnight so that when the building starts to perk up during the, the evening towards sunrise, uh, we can meet the demand charge as um, uh, new fans go on, as lights go on, etc. <coughs> um, we have a proposal from them which is uniquely structured to be not only the initial study to prove whether or not uh, economically uh, the proposal is, is viable, but second, third, and fourth phases that deal with, um, let's say, the design, the uh, estimate for what the project would cost to buy and install the batteries, etc. So this, uh, this discussion tonight is only for the first phase, and that's the study to determine the economic viability of creating uh, storage batteries um, for um, the use in offsetting or eliminating the demand charge. Uh, the study a dollar amount, uh, which is current, uh, they did update the study uh, recently, uh, is $9,675. And uh, I forgot what the schedule is, but I think it's a, only a couple of months to get to the point where we would be talking about an additional um, phase two or, uh, of the pro program to get to the next step. Um, and so my request to the school committee is, number one, if you think it's a good idea, and two, if you do, to, uh, to authorize the, uh, uh, the school committee to issue a PO to them in the, this amount. Clearly, the proposal needs to be reviewed by David relative to the uh, the fin financial um, terms and conditions of this proposal, which we haven't done yet, but so I would I would then request a motion and and a vote uh, on this proposal, subject to uh, finance uh, director's review and concurrence with the terms and conditions of the proposal. Okay. Did you have a question? I had a question. Did sure. they did they indicate what kind of estimate it would be to actually implement the batteries uh, no somewhere around range no no hmm. but you get to choose that I guess in terms of the next phase as to whether you want to go any farther but what you do get is whether or not um, let's say conditions are correct today or might be in six months hmm. 
to make the, the decision to move forward into phase two. This study will tell us how much it probably yes. is going to cost. Yeah, it'll give us a budget estimate. Because this is the design feasibility, the financial modeling, the schematic design, and the production analysis. Yep. Steve? So, uh, I, I really like the proposal. Um, I just have a question. Is there a cost uh, amount associated with phase two? Oh, yeah. Yeah. As you notice in the proposal, the only uh, there's, I don't know, four or five blanks. The first one is this one, uh, phase one, and, the, and it's been, um, you know, the number is 96.75. And like I said, it's an unusual proposal in the sense that uh, it, what is laid out in the proposal are the additional phases and what happens. Normally when you ask for a study, that's what you get. And you don't get anything else or, or indication of what else might have to happen. Uh, and this is laid out to give us a pretty good idea of at least what the phases would be and, and how, uh, how that effort would break down. Dave, did you have a... Uh, no, I think I'm, I'm all set. I mean, okay. in terms of uh, Mr. Durrett's summary, um, okay. no additional comment. No. So I guess our next question really is, um, are we ready to move forward with an motion for accepting phase one of this uh, eliminating the monthly cost of demand charge, meaning the, the feasibility study, the, the first phase? Are we ready I, for that motion? I hope so, uh, but I won't make it because obviously I've been involved in creating what you're talking about now. I'll, I'll move the motion to approve the phase one to to the um, what do they call battery it? storage proposal. To the battery storage proposal, the phase one design feasibility, financial modeling, schematic design, production analysis study. Uh, okay. Do we have a second? Second. And is there any more discussion? All in favor? Aye. We have a five to zero vote, five being present. So that passes to move forward on phase one. And my understanding was in Steve's presentation, though, you want it pending, kind of anchoring a discussion with David Gordon about how we would finance the 9,000 for phase one. Yeah, my then, expectation would be that uh, that the PO would be written against the fields project, uh, subject to the availability of money. Okay, that's that's so clarifying. Where going. Yes, yeah. so I was. I didn't want to lead you there, but I was like, well, and where am I getting that money? Yeah. All right. Okay. Subject so to the availability yeah. of the money. Of the yeah. money and, and were you work. thinking then that it would be kind of hovering there as potentially encumbered against the potential of that money? Um, and we wait and see and then do that or do you want to just we can take some of this offline to this further discussion yeah, but I, we need know. further discussion because one of the things I want to do is, is have the proposal written to the school department or, or the school so you know complete cost against potential remaining funds of the fails project mm -hmm. for complete implementation I mean I, I, I see where, where you're going with that. I just wonder, so I think Dave and I need to sit down and yeah, look and I, at that. I can help you out. If you recall, we had two pieces of fails. One was the design effort. Yep. And the second was the construction. Uh, there is money left in the design effort. Yep. So okay. I, don't, I don't think we have to worry about the source. Perfect. I love that. Thank you. Perfect, thank you. Okay. So, um, this is just a mention. Mass General Law, Chapter 7138N, requires the school committee hold an annual public budget hearing on the school budget. As has been our practice in previous years, the hearing was posted as part of the school committee agenda to begin at 6.15 p.m. The order of operations for the public budget hearing will be the following. Amber will first present her final budget presentation with her recommended budget. This will be followed by questions from the school committee. I'll then call on resi Westboro residents who are here for this purpose who have questions as part of the discussion, followed by potentially more questions, should there be any, by the school committee. Then we will close the bu public budget hearing. It is currently 6.15. Do I have a motion to open the public budget hearing at this time? So move. Do I have a second? Second. Steve, um, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Okay. We have a five to zero vote, five being present. We are now officially in the public budget hearing. So, Amber, you want to 
take it away. Thank you very much. All right, so I'm going to have Daniel open that up, and Dave and I will be off and running. Um, all right, so we have reached the point of final recommendation, and what we will do is kind of walk through this whole presentation, and it, it, it always, I think it's important, we revisit components of all the presentations, because sometimes people are tuning in for the first time, so we always try to have a thoughtful recap that allows people to kind of catch up to where we are, participate in understanding the discussion, and then um, we'll have our discussion. Um, and then if you, you don't have to have a lot of discussion, but you have to, because you also have two additional weeks beyond this point to take feedback, send questions, reflect, um, and then we would meet on December 14th for that, that final vote. So Dave and I will present as we did before. The two of us are simply going to kind of um, walk back and forth through the presentation, give you a full picture of what led to our final recommendation, and then we'll open it up for discussion, okay? All right. Okay, so um, the first piece we look at is always, as I just said, giving you a picture of where we've been, pulling out the salient points in past budgets so that you have a picture, looking at um, the cost centers that are impacted in 24, looking at what we learned from WLT, the leadership team, for recommendations, outlining known impacts, and then how we got to recommendation. So you'll see we're at November 30th here with the, with the public hearing, and then you'll see that on December 5th, um, we will be meeting with FinCom. That's Monday next week so that we get an opportunity to sit with them and go in depth into their questions and thoughts around the budget recommendations. They're always very thoughtful around watching our meetings on Westboro TV and then sending questions and being prepared and ready to discuss the budget. So we look forward to doing that. Typically one of you usually joins us if you're able to. Um, you can have two, but then beyond that you're gonna hit a quorum. So typically it's just important that, um, I think it's good to have um, you know, someone there, typically it's Lisa or Steve, um, given chair or vice chair, but we'll see, you know, where we are. Dave and I would then, it's in Dave's office, and he carries the bulk of really the discussion with them to answer all their financial questions. So I want to just begin by saying that I'm really pleased with the process that David and I and the team have been able to leverage with this budget season to increase a lot of the um, shared planning on the budget to make sure that we've been able to take feedback from WLT while we were also pretty clear and firm that the budget cycle was not going to have many adds to it. And I think you saw that in the responsiveness uh, by which they you know, understood as well that we were gonna be looking just at very specified targeted <coughs> needs and, and they've interacted with us along the way to make sure that they feel the budget's responsive. And I just wanna give a shout out to um, the finance team in Dave's office, I think they've been doing an incredible job to run reports, sort numbers, look at things together, and it's just been a very highly collaborative process. I think we really enjoyed um, more up close work uh, with Paige in the office and, and also uh, Kathleen. So, you know, really people that are on the ground and, and can run reports and um, help us make good decisions. Yep. So let's start with a recap. Great photo. It is I, a cute photo. I think photo. it's worth noting. I have, I, in my <laughs> time here, this is the first one we've actually included Superintendent Bach in one of the <laughs> pictures, so. Um. Yeah, I'm with my bad ears. It's, you know, it's, it is Halloween. Um, so it, it's important to start with 21 and 22 over those two years where we leveraged quite a few cuts to the budget, working collaboratively with the town to make sure that we could respond during COVID um, anxieties and concerns. And the ones that are highlighted for you there, the technology, the facilities, trash, electricity, and, and facilities in that other year across those two years are areas where you're seeing us try to respond to, to bring back some pieces. If you think about the technology, 
The uh, if you click on that, yeah, um, it doesn't. It's not. Working. Um, Oh, there it is. There it is. Look at that. Wow. Okay, so we did restore. <laughs> I know I, I actually added a cute graphic, so I wanted to make sure it worked. Um, the technology we restored in FY23, a portion of that funding, because over several years, technology had lost really a substantial impact, and the rotational care and support of devices and infrastructure across six buildings and 4,000 students and 700 faculty is a giant machine of work. So I think, you know, again, you'll see that there's funding restored in this budget cycle as well. I think a couple other relevant pieces to hold out. We always give you a snapshot of our budget history, the rotation of our percentage increases year over year. Um, and I think there's always a story attached to each of those years. And I think what's important about looking at those reflective numbers are to recognize that each year we build the budget is based upon the needs of that year. And I think you see that in the variability of the percentages, which is you know different demands at different times and different impacts will drive the fiscal needs of any given year. And so for me, that's the story of those percentages as we look at those. Uh, and you'll know that each of those provided for very unique individual years. The three that are highlighted there are ones that hit the COVID transition where we did make the cuts and then began to stabilize for FY22 where we put money back in around some of the pieces that we just talked about um, were coming back from 20 and 21 where we took the most substantial cuts. And then you see the fiscal 23 with the return to special town meeting looking for the additional funding for the tuitions. When you look at the uh, budget this year that we're in currently implementing, you'll remember that we level funded everything other than the technology funding we've called out and uh, a small blip in athletics to make sure we're supporting the coaching costs or the referee costs. And you'll see that the vast majority of where we've had additional impact in cost was in special education. And that number is basically, you see at the bottom, it's the combination of the, the gap that we funded, which was roughly 630,000, and then going back to town meeting for the additional supports for the additional students that went out. So when we exited the budget, season at the end of 23 the number in that total was the 631 and then it's increased by the special town meeting request so that's where you see the the million two which dave has called out is that did, that's did i get that yep, right absolutely yep so now we can look forward into 24 do you want to do this one? Sure. Um, the, the rationale for this slide, it's, it's a, con uh, uh, a condensed slide from two historic slides uh, of the previous presentations. One just to highlight, um, as we've been talking about, some of the OSD inflation, but I mean, that inflation and the cost of uh, materials and supplies has, um, you know, long before I think the actual inflation number of OSD was put out, um, you know, anytime we talked about building projects or anything, we always talked about at one point it was 30%, you know, so the number, I think, um, this sheet basically highlights the fact that we knew we were coming into some, um, I would say, a unique experience related to funding sources um, and how to how to basically best manage to ensure our student-centric process, but at the same time, made sure we had resources available or, or the funding available for the increase of what we were going to see, whether it was materials and supplies uh, across the board or staffing shortages and things like that. Um, the uh, on the right side, you'll see the contract negotiations, uh, which are ongoing. We feel uh, we're in a suitable place. For some of those, um, and then again, obviously with the non-unions, we always want to make sure that we keep our central office and our team, um, not only that, but the administration and the technology team as as our, uh, I would say, our, our strong stewards of on-the-ground service to make sure that they are um, appropriately compensated and in, 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 in feeling validated for the work they do. Uh, just in sure. case people have not been seeing the previous presentations. Yep. Can you just explain what OSD means? Sure. Anytime you come to an acronym, sure. I feel like if people haven't been 
follow sure. Uh, OSD is the uh, operation operations uh, operational service department, and they are essentially they oversee all um, purchasing um, for school districts. Um, and the combination of what you're seeing in FY24, the 14%, is in essentially, um, and part of my s summation of this, it is a increase of uh, material supplies and service, uh, which is approximately, I believe, was 8%, uh, give or take, and then the uh, potential impact to staffing, which was the additional um, 5% or 4, uh, 6% to get to the 14%. Um, that is not unique to Westboro. It is um, f being felt in all districts, all, um, I would say, almost all industries of education. Um, so that is essentially what, what that OSD inflation is. Just, just to add, the Operational Services Division is a state agency. Yes, it's a state agency. Exactly, it is. Um, it's they're, they're the driver force for essentially everything under the state preview, which is school districts um, and, and all of the could, the uh, contractors and vendors that we use. And historic. Oh, just, just to add one other point, it's a mandate. It, yeah, exactly, it exists. It is. Right. I think historically, you can see in looking at those percentages that they've been advantageous to um, group bids and cluster purchasing, and then also the trajectory of goods and services, you know, growing modestly. Um, so to see that kind of jump, we, we certainly didn't anticipate it. So you know we've talked over several budget cycles that we're preparing to cover for that so that the cost escalations of all of our contracts and services don't catch us unaware. Uh, and that brings you to this slide. Sure. Uh, so this, sure. Go ahead, Before Steve. we move on, yep. what you're looking at in that photo is failed school. <laughs> yeah. So uh, as Mr. Durrett said, that is our uh, lovely new failed school. As you can see, lots of, lots of uh, natural light coming in. Um, it's an amazing space. So um, um, on the times I visit, I've been extremely wowed, and I'm sure once we do an open house and the constituents have a time to see it, they'll be as, as pleased as I am. Um, referred, related to the slide, this is our special education student services, uh, in short, summary of what took place. Um, the top box um, I want the, is the actual, the 3.311 one, um, one, one number. That is the entire student services budget of FY23. Reflecting back to the former slide of OSD at 14%, if we were going to increase, which is inclusive of out of district, collaboratives, and discretionary expenses for the Department of Special Education, the 14% on the 3.3 million would be 460,000, bringing the total budget up to 3.7 million. The lower portion I wanted to pull out because I wanted to basically articulate the impact to just the potential decision or um, I would say a, a, a potential strategy uh, would be to actually um, do an assessment of some of the discretionary spending within special education, ensure that we have enough to maintain appropriate, if not exceed, service models to students, but then only apply the 14% to the added district, which would be added district private tuitions and collaboratives. That number is 2.7 million. 14% of that 2.7 million would be that 381,000. From a global standpoint, it's a very small number to me. From a from a 60 million dollar standpoint, I did want to just call it out so it was basically shared information, and that the constituents could see that these are kind of the um, these are the. Uh, challenges that Superintendent Bach and I had when we decided to um, ensure that we were providing appropriate service to students, making sure that we were going to stay sustainable for all the students that are in district, but at the same time um, be able to be uh, financially prudent in doing so into 24. This slide right here, a little bit long-winded, a lot of information. Um, it is essentially uh, um, Mr. Nadan had asked last time, essentially, what is what makes up the three point three million dollars? So, as you can see, special ed private tuition starting from the bottom up, system private tuition, 
is at 2.5 million. That is our out of district. The line above that is the collaborative amount. And then going for going uh, continuing up the slide is basically the breakdown of what the 3.3 million dollars is. Um, rather than get into the weeds, if there's any specific questions related to this, happy to help you know, offline or anything, but if someone has specific questions, we can discuss. Um, essentially, I, I refer to them as discretionary costs, but they're essentially, uh, I'm using that term very lightly, they're not discretionary, they're basically how the, how, how the resources spread throughout the district. And I think to echo that, the, the piece of this is, a, and the same would, would look similar to each of the school-based budgets where they have all the delineated line items for um, supplies, services, and, and some contracted services and things. Typically, you can see that Sherry submitted hers as Director of Student Services. Sherry Stevens submitted hers as level funded, which is how typically they have been rolling the budgets forward year over year. So when you look at cumulative impact of that, you'll see in the budget decisions that, that David and I are presenting to you um, some strategic decisions to try to move some of those forward. Uh, and we'll talk about SPED in a minute here, but you'll get a chance to look at all of that. Do you want to do this Sure. One? So, um, so the targeted needs, again, around technology, we've been able to, to talk about with you. It is the lifeblood circulatory system of the district, is really how you have to think about it around teaching and learning, infrastructure, everything we do is, is fed by the strong networking and supply of, of both hardware, software, and manpower that drives the district. Um, the amount of seamless capacity that our technology department actualizes is very high quality and I think that we're so used to it that honestly if your Wi-Fi blips you, you think you're having a crisis I mean the service delivery of the IT team cannot be held to a higher standard than the praise we can give it it is really a strong team um, behind the wall as we call it you know the the um, all of the hardware functions well and is kept updated and the systems analysis work so that we don't have problems with delivery is really impressive. That does cost money and I think as David said, you know, John does a great job, John Green, Director of Technologies, to know how to rotate his budget at a very high level. So when his requests come forward, they're incredibly well vetted against really the cost analysis of what he needs. So you're seeing price increases. Here's the calculations that drove his request. Um, price increases on laptops, iPads, and Chromebooks. Usually he extends the rotation of life and the circulation of those items to manage some cost impact. So I just, you know, that's probably what springs into your head. Well, you know, can we keep them longer? Have we looked at resale? He has a very healthy resale and turnover rate that he has contracted to get the percentages back. Um, he has a rotation of life service on the iPads and on all the equipment to allow for it to give us the best it can. IT support, we have had to leverage um, some changes to contracts as the market has become really competitive and we lost several people and we just can't have that kind of turnover to, to keep our training um, up with things functioning. Um, contracts of all the services we have are increasing in terms of we have a lot of uh, contracted services for um, databases and all sorts of companies that come in and take care of all of our stuff. Replacement of projectors, we're on a rotation right now beginning to do a cycle of infrastructure updating over time to bring all through with a first priority to all three elementary schools Fails got the rotation through the building project for a full update to the most current instructional teaching boards. And so we've started a rotational cycle to bring those to the other two K-3 schools. And then we have a pilot program of by grade level or subject for faculty to start to get their hands on those new prototypes so that they can start to rotate them in. So that's a very beginning cycle and he'll stretch that out based upon funding appropriation. But he has to keep the cycle you know, fairly close together. And then he has an estimated planned cost there for the update of our Wi-Fi. This, uh, this slide here, this is, um, this again pre was shown at a previous uh, uh, school committee meeting. This is essentially um, working with um, the facilities uh, leadership 
team, we um, essentially ask them to go ahead and do some analysis of their budget, historic spending, but also, um, um, I guess, project out for what they felt was going to be the appropriate um, increase going forward. Um, as was discussed in a previous slide, facilities um, was impacted by some of the COVID cuts. So for us, uh, at least for me, my, a part of my feeling is bringing them back to status quo, but there's also the, the concern as to what's appropriate based on what we know is going to happen in 24. So this is the uh, initial uh, assessment that was sent uh, to uh, myself and Superintendent Bark related to the facilities assessment. Um, we then went back and sat with the facilities team, which is inclusive of um, Bob Ferguson, Kelly G. Capello, and then we also incorporated uh, Bill Garabino, um, who is our on-ground kind of expert related to um, just maintaining service in, in a highest level of, uh, I guess, um, capital maintenance that we can ask for. Um, so we asked them, we had some broader discussions as to what, to what we thought was going to um, transition and where things could look like, and if we had to make some cuts, where would they be? Sure, go ahead. Yep. Um, so as Dave was saying, did a nice job to kind of hone in with them and then make a proposal back on these numbers, which, you know, I, I think are sound. Up top you see too the electrical and the fuel are fixed costs that are contracted now to come in at uh, the rate that you see the 17% and the 30% so those can't be tampered with. Trash removal we're way under so that 30,000 is still conservative. Um, and grounds and services as we looked at that cost given the escalation of contract with all of the different companies who come in and do different parts of service across our six schools um, felt that that's an appropriate increase. And then I think he took a strategic reduction of 5% across all the supplies um, to make sure that we just kind of tighten down on our use of those. I think, I think Kelly G. Capello keeps the buildings well supplied. We're not going to not have what we need. We're careful, but we're going to slow our purchasing cycle and show just through next year probably carry less um, backup supply. And you know, and she can anticipate what we what we might need something on. But for a starting place, she felt confident in yep. that. Um, I think, and again, Dave can talk about the others if you have specific questions. But the high school, uh, we, I felt comfortable when we went back in and Dave looked at that as well with them to uh, reduce that down uh, quite a bit because we really felt that while the high school was very, very expensive last year in terms of maintenance calls and facilities work, some of that we think will dissipate because we were able to hire an electrician and those contracted services will, will drop and we already see a better control on that mechanism. And then secondarily, we had had a lot of uh, plumbing issues, and I hope we have the majority of those resolved. That's a very pricey call when you, when you have to make those. So um, I think those are strategic changes. And then um, bringing you down basically about a $73,000 reduction from their requests. But still certainly a commitment to recognizing that given that 14% weight of um, anticipated increase to contracted services and purchasing, um, that the request they're making feels logical. And you met with them more, so if you have other things to yeah. add. No, I wouldn't, um, no additional comments. I would, again, we, we, we took the approach, um, again, assessing supplies was the big thing, was making sure that we weren't, uh, going to be in a, in a world of jeopardy at some point. So I would say our resources are, are, are suitable, if not exceed suitability for next year. And then, um, again, I would just echo the fact that the, the bringing on staff person of the electrician, and then again, a lot, um, the potential impact to the t some of the plumbing issues may have actually, actually dissipated based on... Um, uh, my feeling is it's just better communication and messaging at the high school level as to appropriateness of, of the use of some of those facilities. And I would say the other one that you looked at, because you wanted some feedback on the items that had gone up, you know, at a certain amount. If you look at the equipment maintenance there uh, with a $65,000 increase, 
they have an interest in starting to move towards some in-house maintenance. We do have one of our maintenance people who has some um, large equipment skill for maintenance and could do some of the small repairs and maintenance on, uh, we have a lot of equipment, um, snow blowers and mowers and machines and so uh, scrubbers that do the hallways plus trucks. So you know, we were, interested in maybe being able to do some of our base maintenance which right now we contract out in order to do that we would have to make some purchases for probably a lift in one of our garages and we're not quite there yet we've made some um, planning for it but it would need to be set up properly i think and, and it would be a future kind of investment to get a cost savings but we're you know dave wants to research it more so we put a hold on the plan until he could get a closer look at it with the team uh, and until then I think carrying enough to get our equipment cared for properly has to be carried just as a baseline item yep. just a quick question sure is the equipment that, uh, below that has no is, is it general equipment, the 30,000, it's the third line? I yeah, yeah. so uh, the equipment maintenance line would be essentially um, kind of current equipment plus new equipment that we purchased over the last, say, three years. So the maintenance on those, um, and then, again, the escalation of cost to ensuring those function well. The uh, line below is essentially we did an assessment as the need to actually purchase new equipment, and right now it seems pretty minimal based on the fact that our inventory is pretty high. So yes, that's, there's maintenance versus the equipment would be the, the ability to actually make purchases if necessary. Okay. Um, there's also, while well, some of these line items, we did our, our best attempt to specify the need, there is ability for us to do some journals within the budget itself. So for example, if, um, for example, I'm just using if mill pond maintenance is, is running low for next year, we could obviously uh, switch the budget to equipment if we need to make a large purchase. As long, you know, I, I try not to manage to the bottom line per se for them. I really want them to stick within uh, their current their charge strings, but at the same time, uh, there is a level of flexibility amongst the number if we needed to make some changes. Yeah, I would agree, and I think when we looked at the discussion, I think we had some differing opinions, and you know, they they lead the department, and we want to give them time to track and provide justifications, I would have probably increased facilities, contractual services more and reduced equipment. You know, I probably would have made a shift there. They wanted to do a neatly based allocation and track it through next year, knowing that if we needed to do a line item transfer, we can. But we'd rather get the line items uh, closest approximation in budgeting to where we think those funds will come. So I think Dave's pressed the team a lot to tighten that down, and I think you know you'll see probably next year an adjustment of not an increase, but but a reallocation across how they're tracking those items. Uh, and just one final comment: we we are doing monthly assessments basically on spend rates, so we're doing that now. So it, it, we're so early that you know we're we're still doing spend rates on twenty three, but we we will do the same thing for twenty four. <laughs> And one other question was about grant services. Yep. Was that one of the decreases from 2021? I mean, the amount of... Uh, it, it specifically, I you know, I don't know if it was specifically from 21. I know there was there was cuts to the budget in general. It could have, it could have came from there. Yeah. Um, but based on the fact of um, when you... Because a lot of that's contractual services. We just okay. need to be cautious of the fact of... Um, uh, this in this one specific example, landscaping and what their increase would be outside of the forty percent. Say it's related to fuel charges of their machines. Uh, so we just want to be cognizant that this is not there. Yeah, they th cuts. yeah, they had almost a hundred thousand dollars of cuts over those two years. Right. So you know they're feeling that and and how they can hold on maintenance but then you see for example uh just an increase in the contract of service for lawn care and having someone come in and do the plumbing work or, and the electrical like those contracted service pieces are very expensive as is the general cost of equipment replacement and supplies just kind of escalating so keeping that 14 percent in mind as we come into <coughs> next year and kind of protecting against that we want to be really careful um so all right Let me just get i think i was bringing it up because the covid number that's sitting on the slide it says sixty-one thousand, but it's really a two-year covid cut 
Right. Yes. Close to almost 100000 Exactly. Yeah. Well, and we had worked really hard. When you look back at those COVID cuts, some of those funds that we haven't brought back, we'd worked very hard to get a stabilized $30,000 um, furniture um, line item because we were always trying to wait till the end of the year to see if we had any potential savings to purchase furniture, and it's just not a good cycle. You can't be as thoughtful with it. You can't get in enough bids. You can't talk to people thoughtfully about what they need and trade furniture internally and cascade things like there's definitely an art to managing furniture and planning ahead for what you need when even if you just do a rotation of replacing rugs you know rugs need to be replaced regularly at the elementary level on some five-year cycle and so when you're doing that, it's just hard to be thoughtful if you're always going to be like, well, we'll wait and see if we have any potential areas where we could use funds at the end of the year. So we cut that back. I think we're only carrying 10. Mm -hmm. Now we had carried 30. So those are the types of things that it just take us time to recover from. Um, and I would imagine by next year, FY25, we would restabilize that back to 30 as an example so that we can start to do more planning on furniture rotation again. Um, that's the kind of stuff that's like feels like very small detail but we're just trying to give you a flavor for the way we come in and out of the meetings with people and work with them to make strategic decisions while also kind of planning ahead in our notes for like okay next year I, like I was talking with Paige I said next year Paige I want to add that I got to bring that furniture back to 30 in the base so those are the types of things that kind of we're always working on um, do you want me to do this one? Yeah. Okay. So I'll do the next two, which is the budget requests as we had them. And all of the things that, that we presented to you the last time are still as we're moving forward. We're still going to maintain um, looking for a trainer if we can find one utilizing student athletic fees. We'll maintain keeping the additional school nurse, sustaining it on a grant. We will pass on the additional reading support at fails for now. We will um, manage the expansion of the girls hockey team with a student activity revolving account for the startup of year one, anticipating that a portion of that may come into budget the following year, dependent upon the, the kind of the balance of that student activity um, account. I mean, it's made for that. It can stay on that and be maintained there, um, but it's just an important part for us to continually assess. Um, the curriculum purchasing and uh, work that Daniel needs to bring those items into our core are carried in budget. You'll see it in his line item when we get there. Um, we will, um, I have some thoughts on the furniture purchasing and the piano that we'll do through some alternative work and I'll show that a little bit later. So that's all the work we did to kind of get us to a place of being ready to kind of move towards a final recommendation. And the other things that we sustained, just kind of circling back to other presentations, we maintained the anticipated uh, thinking of using a 3% for the buses. Uh, the CPI is 7.3. We're going to come in conservatively and roll it at 3% um, and track our costs and and uh, billing really closely. Um, it takes a great amount of, you know, just maintenance to track that all the runs happen the way they did, that we don't, you know, pay bills we get billed for if runs didn't go. Cindy does a very good job on that cost analysis. She's really going to squeeze that, and we'll hope to uh, do well with that percentage increase. There was a... Um <clears throat> A caveat to this was that the last, in FY22, there was uh, some surplus at the end of the year related to transportation. It's a very complicated, due to COVID, due to transportation impacts, driver shortage. It wasn't as simple as saying, here are the rides, here's the budget versus here are the rides based on the nuances, doubled routes, things of that nature. So we felt based on uh, using what we projected as would be is had we come to full fruition what it would look like and we felt that the budget is actually sustainable and that the three percent would actually allow us the opportunity to be in a, in a better position if you if what we did was factor in in the covid final year adding what we thought would it what it should have looked like we still felt that a three percent increase was appropriate so I think there's a couple pieces there that we want to look at because whenever you see a big number drop like that the difference is 
if we carried this the CPI, you'd be looking at another 3.2 million. So to just say we're going to carry the three, well, yeah, because uh, did I do that? Okay, sorry. Yep. Where are you? Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry. We're carrying the 92 instead of the 225. Yep. So when you look at that, you know, if we're off, we will have to cut elsewhere or we had close to that amount of savings last year. So Dave's looked at it really closely and said, okay, let's run it for one year, see how the runs play out, and we should be close. Yes, and d d there's also the caveat that we're not back to 100%. So, um, you know, we're, we're short of us. Um, our, our agreement with the NRT van pool is, is not 100% there. Um, so it, it's the, the look back versus the projecting forward isn't crystal clear. Um, but based on what we think, um, another, another caveat to the number of the 92,000, last year when we did the number based on what would it be to add a bus, it's about 100. 10,000 out of us so we felt that that was appropriate considering the fact that hypothetically if 24 looks like what it should we'll be fine I think we'll be in a good position yeah yep. and last year like as you look at budgeting cycles and how this works when you look at like we had some of that savings because those runs didn't go and all the pieces that we had built in there around not having bus and different pieces allowed us to cover um overages spendings in the facilities so again like you see the correction now in facilities and you see a tighter reduction here so each budget cycle feeds the plan of the response of the next one and the numbers have been swinging because of covid it's really hard to look at these and get a you know a thoughtful rollover on so many major cost centers but having looked a lot at this i feel like these two make sense you're seeing less carried in in transportation and then an increase in uh, maintenance and facilities where we had overages even with one bus down we are doing pretty good right? yeah, yeah i mean that is to not take away from the effort of westboro i mean I, you know we are still the model i i can say that with absolute certainty that uh, there's other districts that are very fond of what we're doing especially related to the big yellow bus um nrt our, our partners with um Eric and Jackie, who are basically our point persons, have been extremely thoughtful and helpful. Eric actually gets on the buses and drives for us if someone goes down. Um, the ability to relate to some of the other districts' problems, we are, um, again, we're, we're the model. We are, are a pillar in this in this hardship. For, and, and the impact to families and other districts is, is um, it's part of my expression but it's it's pretty disgusting that the time and the amount of time they're missing out of school and the impact here their ability to do so um th th there's a lot to be said there are not some people in our own town who are dealing with that double that bus or late bus yeah but in the comparisons of other towns yes yeah really definitely i think the other part of that is there's areas where we have very targeted still struggles and one of them is transportation to athletics and i just want to call that out um, I was interacting with Johanna DiCarlo today and actually need to up, bring, update Dave. We're looking at carpooling. Districts are moving towards a strategic backup of carpooling and signatures and sign-offs and then reimbursing parents for gas because they can't get buses. So if you can't leave for a competition, if they're going to give you a bus an hour and a half later than you need to leave for a competition, it just blows up the whole sports model. And so... Um, right now, getting in preparation for winter sports, Johanna's just getting ready. She asked a preliminary request of me to start to make a plan based upon what we see other districts doing. So your basically emergency backup is carpooling, and everybody would need to sign off on it. We would need to set up a structure. She's going to take a first pass at that. Dave and I are going to talk about it, and we'll probably provide an update to you. So, you know, they've got to be able to get stuff. So this is their one season, their, their one thing they're doing, and standing there with no bus just basically brings it to a standstill. And again, I don't think that people have an understanding of, have any understanding of what it is to be an athletic director and the amount of moving pieces with all of your sports teams, all of your buses, all of your game playing, all of your refs, 
floor time. You can't even, all of those are, are fragmented right now. And so the complexity of that is just daily nightmare of transitions. So she's trying to get in front of that. She's interacting with a lot of people that already put this model in place. So um, I just think it's important that people realize the busing shortage of staff is, is real even though we're in a much better place. Because we're talking about that. We're really talking about the shortage of staff more than... Oh, yeah. Yes, and I, I, um, the last comment I would add, um, we, we are actively recruiting. We are doing everything we can as a district to not only promote or recruit internally among staff if they have the availability, but, uh, you know, for parents and families, um, we are... Uh, the partner of NRT um, to the to the point is where I think we're going above and beyond in terms of an effort to to try and increase those numbers of drivers. We're also looking at proposals to look at getting a, a wheelchair capacity van because we've gotten stuck so many times not being able to transport students and then we're in non-compliance around components of special education the escalation around that just gets more and more complex so these are the big ticket items of just both strategic management but also financial impact and none of those are quick solutions you know whenever we're trying to deal with them so steve yeah um Certainly, years ago, uh, carpooling was the solution to many things. Uh, however, in our litigi litigious society, uh, obviously, how you do that, and one, to shield the, the parent who's driving from the liability of what they're actually doing, um, I think that needs to be part of the model if we're going into the idea that just because we can't find a driver, that parents are going to carpool. I mean, maybe NRT would hire them as an employee, and and therefore we would uh, those parents would be under the umbrella of their insurance. I mean, there's a whole bunch of things beyond the the common sense approach of this is my kid in my car, and you know I'll take two other kids and go where they got to go. Um, I, I I think it's a very complicated uh, issue, and it needs to be put to school council as to how do we do it right. so that the parents aren't suffering. Meanwhile, the, the town is protected as well. Right, and so I think in terms of models, there's definitely several districts working on this. So there's, we always get legal consult. We always look at the appropriate contractual things that need to be done. So certainly we'll do it in a thoughtful way, but we also have to get to a place where you know, you're faced with students and parents basically demanding solutions. Yeah. So well, we spend all day on the phone with people demanding solutions, and when we have no way to provide a solution, we can't bring a driver and bring a bus we're going to have to default so at this point you see dis districts you know trying to it's not even be creative it's be compliant to run your programming so more on that but i think it's important when we look at busing to say to dave's point that um, because of the vigilance of our team and dave's good work with nrt and with cindy and with lisa i think we're probably better off than, than almost everybody yep. appreciate that bus update <laughs> in between yes. I know yeah. well it's kind of nice yeah. to see the numbers brought live to the complexities I mean there's you know this is a fairly short presentation tonight and I think it's important that we remember that every one of these dollars represent complex decisions and hard-fought you know plans to run the district so I think it's you know important um, so as we look at um, these leveraged opportunities for uh, cost saving or um, management, we are always uh, utilizing what we can around revolving accounts and different sources. We did apply the community ed $200,000 against um, building maintenance, uh, electricity, um, and custodial time. So because community ed rents space from us, we always take of the rent and uh, money that they pay to offset a portion of you know, the electrical costs and things. So the applied offset for community ed, that's been annual year over year. I just think it's important that you know it's there visually. Usually in the budget book, you see it as literally an offset cost down the electrical line item of and I think, I don't know if you're running it that way, but that's how Irene showed it. Mm -hmm. You see it in the budget book. You see the actual offset. Um, we anticipate that the small remaining part of ESSER funds will be applied against the 
impact and for now not accessing that school revolving account for um, funding but I am beginning to think that I will use it to purchase the CSS furniture needs that we had at the high school either in this year or next year and based upon the fundraising plan that the they put in place for the piano typically we've offered in the past some matching funds I mean 70,000 is a lot so you know I think we'll probably try to leverage that for a part of that funding and then they'll do some fundraising um, but just kind of holding that for now and then I think Dave felt strongly that any other additional um, FTE being pushed onto the preschool tuitions wasn't advised at, at this time, but that it, we would hold it as an emergency option if we needed a para during the year somewhere that we could rotate a para, an additional para onto the um, revolving account and then access opening up some salary to cover an emergency. So that's the kind of planning I think where we are in terms of uh, some offset options. Yep. Um, so look at how cute that picture is, by the way. I just want to say we have, like, the world's cutest children. Um, so from here, uh, do you want to do this one? On the next sure. One? I can. Uh, so this <laughs> was the um, initial slide that we presented uh, last presentation. This is essentially when you look at O&M um, in Basically, as we mentioned, um, we are cognizant. We did increase school budgets by uh, about 2%, working very diligently with our uh, school leaders and ensuring that their, their needs were felt appropriate. Um, so we feel confident in that number. Um, as you can see, we added the 60000 for curriculum and staff development uh, under uh, Daniel's department. The uh, technology is the 14% OSD increase. As I mentioned in the past, um, John Green is meticulous. When he actually did his assessment of numbers, we almost matched penny for penny. I just did a 14% on his budget. John did the math, and I think we were off by under $10,000. He, he was right. He was so close. Um, so I want to really applaud his effort of managing his budget, working with vendors, getting the lowest cost, but also doing any sort of uh, trade-offs and trade-ins, but he, he was, works very diligently on that. As you can see, the transportation line um, goes up by the 3%, and then the facility's initial assessment was at $643,000. And then student services, if you roll back up, that is the $3.3 million with the 14% on the entire budget. That's that 463. As we mentioned at the previous meeting, we'll work this number down. You know, we made an adjustment on the facilities. Um, we uh, There's some changes based on what we've showed you related to other things that have happened, and we'll show you that in the next slide. But I wanted to at least give you this information as a reminder as to where we were. Um, Those numbers should look familiar. And the 2%, I mean, as a minimal increase given that year over year, I think in my years here, I don't think I've ever let them have an increase. I mean, we've done targeted purchases around specified items, but their base supply budgets and their, and their allotments at their buildings have really not grown at all over at least five years. So a 2% increase will help them cover what's going to happen with some of their I mean, anticipated supply increase costs. They'll have to make some other changes, but that'll help them against that 14%. Because every time a teacher goes in and does a purchase order in the summer, it's going to potentially be at some of those higher costs. So the 2% will make, they'll have to make good strategic decisions around things not to purchase next year against if those impacts come in higher. But that gives them, that gives them a base of responsiveness. Then I think, you know, we're confident that that is manageable. Um, I believe our teachers are well stocked and we try to make good decisions about, you know, if they need anything, we tell them to, to find us and we'll make sure that if they need something, we find a way to get it. Do you want me to do this one? And then you want, what do you want to do? You want to do this one? Um, sure. Um, so this one, um, this is a summary as, as many of you are aware, the circuit breaker ch um, chart can essentially be very confusing. Um, we've actually reach out to other districts of how they do it. They're all essentially, in my opinion, they're all very confusing. <laughs> There's not a simple model or a simple way to display that. Um, as we mentioned, um, the circuit breaker we uh, reimbursement is up about $400,000 more than we 
I don't want to say expected, but it came in uh, 400K higher. So that was you know, some good news for us. Um, an assessment of the special education budget in their true needs um, showed, that, if you recall, the, the circuit breaker was approximately 900K surplus, which was kind of a, a rarity. So if you take away um, you know, the unanticipated tuitions which we built into Circuit Breaker, that is for students that we don't know are gonna show up, which is essentially what happened this current fiscal year is that. So uh, a strategic approach from Superintendent Bach and uh, Special Education Director Sherry Stevens was essentially saying, are we comfortable with this number based on what we know as of November 15th? The $400,000 was uh, put aside as unanticipated tuitions. Then if you look at uh, the circuit breaker increase and then any additional offsets, um, plus the f maintaining a 14% increase on all, but again, what I refer to as discretionary or district-wide cost, uh, that put us at a really good place um, from a budgetary standpoint to ensure that special ed services were maintained and that we did have 400K related to unanticipated finances, uh, unanticipated out of districts cost. I think that's a good approach to managing where we are in the sense that Dave put the 14% on the whole, a whole budget for SPED and we maintained 400,000 budgeted for tuitions. Um, and then if you roll to the next slide. So this is, this is the updated slide, so you can go ahead on this oh, one. Go ahead, you can do it. So this one is the updated slide. So um, I'm gonna bounce back and forth a little bit to help you kind of track. So essentially, just to remind you, pre the special education discussion, this is where we were at. If you take into account the circuit breaker number that we had and the modifications to facilities, uh, you'll see that we are significantly lower, almost a million dollars short, which is basically almost ties out, not ties out to the penny, but it's close to that $928,000. Really what it is is the 400 k that we're holding back. So after again, we proposed a number to, uh, working through the number uh, with Dr. Stevens, uh, Superintendent Park, myself, we looked at this $2.8 million and said based on the potential and the ability that we're holding 400K, how do we feel about this number? Our assessment basically felt that this 2.8 gave the 14% to the district, but also has that $400 kind of a retention saver. And at the same time, we felt that 2.8 million, almost close to 2.9 million, was the appropriate number for next year's budget based on what we know as of today, which we all know is an expedited process. So right now, we're looking at the O&M process, uh, O&M uh, categories of, um, 11 million two, so it's about a $485,000 increase from, for one year. So um, from a financial standpoint, you know, you, you think of 14%, I think we did really well, um, ensuring that we feel extremely student-centric. Um, I'm sure anybody could ask about, again, as we mentioned, the school budgets, but is that um, enough? We talk to the principals, assistant principals, we feel like with their current supplies and the ability to be strategic with some of their expenditures for, for FY24, that that increase, while not significant, was appropriate, and they've, they've all agreed to that. Uh, we feel like we're in a really good place. John is very happy with his technology number. We're very comfortable with transportation at this point. Um, Daniel um, is very pleased. <laughs> as well. So I think we're in a good place for the O and M side. Um, I actually did the numbers twice because I came here. I'm like, did it really only come out to forty five? <laughs> Which is still a lot of money because we also all not every penny is a lot of money. I think it's important that when we're looking at numbers that, you know, all of those are increases. But when you look at against what that increase represents for all of the facilities services across um, the six buildings, all of those building uh, programs and special ed and transportation and 30 percent increase in electricity which is 200,000 like we you know I feel like we came in in a place that um, you know that operational reallocation of the fund savings in sped really helps to you know bring us to that package feeling really uh, advantageous and so when you look at your number like how did that turn out that way like I did the math a couple times um, and I'm always faking the math. Dave does the real math. But I think, you know, the, um, the, the ability to, and people always ask us, well, don't you kind of do zero-based budgeting every year? And I think this is a good example of that where the allocation of all of your 
um, different areas of the budget get looked at every year and those funds you know get reallocated to where they're needed so the reallocation of less in transportation less in sped or and then against the facilities um, and that number being leveraged to still be advantageous while we while we stabilize a couple of things is, is helpful uh, the Lisa's final is doing the math again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The, the final slide, uh, which I'll show you right now, is um, is inclusive of, um, this is O&M, so this is operation and maintenance, and then the final slide is inclusive of what, what I refer to as human capital. So that involves all human beings, every process related to um, staffing. This is our favorite slide. We kind of sometimes want to lead with this slide and then do the presentation and close with it again. But it's just, you know, I think it's better to understand how we build it. Um, I think you see, as, as he is, Dave has really appropriately stepped you through, this represents a 4.5% increase looking at the total salaries and then the operations and management which we've kind of carried you through um, and I think we should talk a little bit about um, that 52 number of the salaries and I think it's important for people to understand that that's all of the human capital costs to running the district so that's every employee we have in district um, we believe that we've met anticipated contractual changes in this number um, we still have a lot of work to do but we believe that um, it could cover our needs um, and we'll keep moving forward in good faith with all those negotiations um, we have in this number substitutes contracted services stipends so there's a lot summer work additional days for guidance in the summer like some of the per diem expenditures for guidance um, so the salary number isn't just paychecks in terms of um, you know what what people are doing to be employed with us for the year it's it's all of the other built around um, funding that drives the district so costs set aside to make sure we have coverages for running summer school as an example all those dollars are in there for for funding allocations of contracted services and summer work um, so that's a complex number which carries all of those and typically um, you know we level fund some arenas year over year and then other times we will increase I know in some years for example we didn't increase the sub allocation for multiple years and then I think last year you saw that we increased the allocation for substitutes so if an area of those go up in a way that's notable we, we show it in the budget planning this year there's nothing particularly notable in the anticipated planning for salaries other than it's steps and lanes for anybody requiring that in their contract and um, you know managing what we hope to be closure on all of our contracts the um, additional comment one would be is that number um, of the 63 million that is inclusive of the 200k from uh, community education so that's applied um, so you, uh, if you're doing the math you, you might get a slightly bigger number but that's inclusive of the 200k um, I think for me one of the big numbers that I saw or one of the big the biggest revelations was when I looked at the 2.7 million um, you know the number 60 million is a, it's a large number so no matter what the increase is it's it's impactful but to, to realize to run a, a district of such with the accolades, accreditations, and the uh, the student progress and uh, just well-being um, to increase from one budget year to the next at 2.7 million, when you know we presented from presentation one a 14% increase, um, and um, 22 categories of, of human capital finances to go up 2.7 million on on 61 million to me. Um, is extremely palatable um, and I think that um, you know the reason why we actually added that picture was it, it it was a collaborative effort you know we just felt that between Superintendent Bach myself um, Dr. Mayor uh, Special Education Director Sherry Stevens uh, John everybody um, 
you know, especially HR, um, we really felt the discussions and the thorough kind of assessments of um, what it looked like, where we were going, what did we need to be prepared and appropriate for our kids. Um, there was a lot of work put into this, so we feel very comfortable with that number. Um, and again, as Amber mentioned early on, the business office staff with, with you know Paige's history and Kathleen's ability to be on the ground and understand some of those numbers um, and just how to leverage other funding sources was critical to this. So um, we felt that picture was appropriate. If you look at the budget history, um, our goal, I wouldn't say that, our goal, one of our approaches, what we looked at was, you know, pre-COVID and some of those numbers. Um, and again, um, we're, we're in a very good place. Um, we put a lot of work into this, um, and we were very strategic on it. Uh, just a note uh, on the uh, history, budget history numbers, the next to the bottom one, it should be special oh, yeah. town meeting 10, 17, 22. 22. Oh, I, collect, I corrected one yeah, of them, but not the other. I didn't it wasn't on that slide. Oh. Oh, thank you. I did the other one. Um, there we go. Live correction. Look at that. It's done. <laughs> and I, I guess I would add one other thing that uh, particularly when we're talking about dollars for salary, it's subject to the availability of money uh, based on town meeting vote. So yes, um, I think we always need to keep that in mind that ultimately the decision on what we ask for is, um, is uh, decided by the town meeting vote of the budget. So. I guess I'll leave, leave the comment at that. Yep. But everything we do relative to any negotiation is subject to uh, the availability of money to pay the bill. Um, definitely. And part of the process of the defense of the budget as we move forward is to make sure that we're answering questions for people. And we recognize that it's certainly a question on their mind when they know that we're in active negotiations with all of our units. Um, I also would note that um, the salary, it's always important uh, to note too, that when you're looking at salaries, we're carrying uh, probably 600,000 uh, of salaries on grant offsets and tuition. So you've got the preschool tuition account, which carries a portion of salaries and you have grants. So currently I think it's weighted um, that there are positions you know, that are still carried on um, those offsets. Um, so, you know, we're always trying to, to maintain that number um, and utilizing, again, we didn't do a slide on that this year, but we always have positions on grants, and you saw it in the revolving account that we held and didn't push any more positions on there. So there were no relative changes in that this year, so we didn't really show it. Um, we have positions that had been carried on the ESSER grant, which the positions went away or the money went away and we held on some of those positions. Those are in salary from last year. So um, no relative changes this year, but I think um, we didn't mention grants, but it's always a part of the total salary package. Yep. Steve? Yeah, I just wanted to express my gratitude for the careful stewardship uh, of the budget. It's much better news than I was really anticipating yeah. the final number and it's it's clear how carefully you're looking over the numbers and you know really giving really uh, adopting a thoughtful approach and it, it's it's a large number I, I agree but the the detail that you're using in surveying all of the numbers is just very impressive and it's 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 reassuring because i i know that you're really managing this large amount of money carefully and you're lever leveraging it in student centered and meaningful ways and I think sometimes at the municipal or town level that gets lost in and and the size of the number gets looked at rather than the the precision at which you are analyzing every single line item and 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 it's I think it's easy to just focus on 
for townsfolk to focus on the large number rather than hearing all of the work at every granular step that goes into this. And so I just, um, th this is my first full round on the budget. And so last year I came in and was handed a huge book <laughs> that was so intimidating. I didn't really, I didn't go through it because y you had already, it had already been passed. But now seeing what goes into this, it's, it's just, it's very edifying. So I, I, I thank you and appreciate the, the work that you've done. Which brings us to the next part, which is, is there anyone here uh, in our audience who is here to have questions about the budget from our residents? Please come forward, state your name and address for the record. Oh, and, and speak into the microphone. Wilfred Savoy, 41 Chestnut Street, uh, and grandfather of uh, a 14-year-old in the high school and a 12-year-old uh, in the middle school and uh, that's basically my intent for being here and also to get a, uh, a clear picture on how tax dollars are spent on education. Um, the superintendent has informed me that she's sent me some information uh, that I'll be looking at and I thank you for that uh, superintendent. Uh, my, my fundamental uh, uh, purpose is to, as I've been saying along, is to uh, get a presentation of the salaries and wages uh, in the detailed budget by cost center to really true get an indication of what is being spent in each cost center. And I'm, you know, you talked about uh, facilities tonight, you talked about uh, special ed, those cost centers uh, those expenditures uh, are part of the picture. Expenditures are part of the picture. Wages and salaries is the other part of that picture. And so my request is to look at each cost center and uh, in addition to expenses, also look at wages and salaries in those centers. Now I know, I know that the school department submits its data to the Department of Ed in that format. So it's not a question of inventing a new wheel here. Uh, it's just what, what I feel would be a more clearer presentation, a more exacting presentation would be to include that in each cost center. Your organization, uh, Mass Association of School Committees, uh, you know, agrees with that concept and they're frequently asked questions they talk about the budget uh, that should be passed uh, at a level of detail that's comparable to DESE, to the Department of Ed. And uh, also that the level of transparency is necessary for the general public to understand that what the school committee <coughs> is doing is in line with your goals. That's, that's the intent here. Uh, and also, I would just finalize that the town also has a very good layout of what the detail should be for its departments uh, on page 73 in their budget information book it talks about line, it line items being presented for both salaries wages and expenses so the town is also looking for this type of information as well by cost center and uh, so that's all I'm looking for basically is a clear presentation uh, that would include salaries and wages by cost centers. And I look forward to reading the uh, information sent by the superintendent as well. Thank you. Thank you. Amber, did you want to respond to that at this time or? Um. No, no, no. I was just saying to, to David, I think I want to look back at when we submit information across, you know, a whole variety of different layers. So I think it's most thoughtful to go back and look at what's in the end of the year report. What do we submit to DESC? What do we have in the budget book? And just kind of look how they're interfacing with each other. I think, you know, and then we'll look at we'll look at his reference to the town budget. I mean, Christie's budget, you know, again, well formulated and, and reads very well. So again, kudos to her uh, 
presentation of that. I think it's a little tighter in some ways because each department surfaces their own budget and, and cost and line items. And so, you know, we certainly would have to, ours would look a little different and we'd have to look at like how we would want to do that. But certainly, um, I'm going to go back and look at like how we submit what we do to DESE and well, think yeah, about what we would build into the budget book that would give us kind of a snapshot of that. The other thing about it is that the cycle is a different cycle. I mean, we go to town meeting in March. I believe that the middle is uh, is October. Yep. And yeah. it's uh, it's you know apples and oranges story. Uh, not to say that they obviously they have to equal each other, but um, I think the difference is that uh, uh, you know the development of it takes about that much time from right. March to October to create the format that goes to the state. Right. So the timeliness of it may not be exactly the same as what you're asking for. Well, I sent him the report we did that we added in the spring around the FTE report, the mm -hmm. one that you had requested, Steve, and that yep. gives you, and it shows the crosswalk across all the different ways and how that data comes in. And I feel like that's a really appropriate staffing snapshot. And then, you know, the question around, you know, the other components we will look at and work off of, so. Yeah, I, I mean, I was just going back to our budget book, which is um, on our website, and uh, you can see every single line item in our entire budget book. And by the way, we have like seven budget books um, online, but I'm just looking at the most recent. So there is a way to look at every single uh, school and every item and every, but, and the other part is that when I go to DESE and I look up FTEs, I see a breakdown, but it's not. But it's very specific cost centers. So it might be broken up by um, paras, yep. uh, you know, special education. Yeah. Um, so it really depends what cost centers you're speaking of. But I, I think he wants to see all of them. I so I mean, I, I <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know. So I mean, the, yeah, the yeah. staffing cost centers you know yes would break out by category as we submit it to to desi yeah. so this and and some of that was broken out in the report that we surfaced for you so i'll let him start by looking at that but i think it, you know it's a, a relevant point to look at is there you know we've adjusted the budget book year over year last year dave wanted to roll it in in parallel to what had been done made some initial changes you know in his uh, streamlined some visualizations in a really nice way and the question is if there's another couple pages we need to delineate that either at the building level or at the district level it's just a piece we would add it's not it's not it's not data we have to create it's just a matter of looking at what we want to show great steve what a yeah I, I i have two comments um one, I, I'm incredibly confused by the idea of cost center. That is a, that's a category that can mean anything. And so to disaggregate salaries by cost center, it depends on what cost centers one is assuming to be a cost center. So that's my first comment. The second is, it would be wrong to assume that this information on salaries isn't already publicly available. All of salary information for public employees is available. It's publicly available information. It requires research and some number crunching, but the information's available. It's published in the annual report. It's in the annual report at the end. All the salaries are there. Yeah, so, I mean, it's, well, yeah, I, I think all of those are correct statements. Um, by, but, I mean, this is the work we do. We're public servants, and so right. we're really happy to provide information. Yeah, no, so I understand, I think I understand a, that. You know, but I think when people ask for things, everybody has different pictures for how they think things sort, and we often are helping people locate information right. that, you know, is accessible somewhere and they're just trying to find it and and good and I think the budget presentation that that Dave um, has crafted through the budget book and I think there's you know more to come in that as he works with it um, it's about clustering it into a story that's and giving data in a way that people can make sense of it Daniel does a really beautiful job of that where he takes analytics and gives it to you in a way you can understand it so I, I understand exactly what's being asked for and I feel confident that you know I think it's I think it's a good discussion point for us to look at yeah I, I just worry that <clears throat> as mr. Durrett said if apples and oranges are being compared 
that can be really problematic if one person's idea of a cost center isn't a line item or, you know, or a department. And that's where yeah. equivalences you know, and parity are, you know, there's no standardization. There's no yeah. uh, essential agreement in, in categories. Can I interject here? Yes. I think so, he's answered so, the question, but go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So what I was going to say is um, the, what we try to do to do a comparison that we think is gets rid of the definitional yep. differences between districts is we look at total expenditures by pupil, yeah. which is available on the DESE website. So there's a, and you might be interested in looking at it, yeah. it's a pupil expenditures report. You can look up it, it, the entire state and search on any district to get <clears throat> how much a district spends per pupil. And so it, to your point, I mean, some districts have different ways of creating their cost centers, and that's why this kind of like aggregate number is there. So, you know, how many assistant principals, how many coordinators, how many reading specialists and all that, you know, varies by district. But at the end of the day, how effectively are you spending your money per pupil compared to other districts is sort of like the all-in measure. Yeah, I think the other piece around, we always remind people around that all-in measure that it includes health care costs and all-in costs and, um, you know, all of the attributable costs in education by town. Um, and so when we're doing our, that is a pretty good relative comparison to say if you're going to look at Hopkinton, Northboro, Shrewsbury, it's an all-in number to what they spend per pupil inclusive of health care, all costs, transportation, Medicaid, like it's got everything in it. Um, and so the town adds to that submission for us and it gets all rolled into a big number against our total number of pupils. So it gives you kind of a healthy benchmark to Daniel's point. But I always think, you know, um, providing information for people around a complex budget is what the season is about. Um, so. I just wanted to make one comment that there is, there is a, a standard for cost centers and it's established by the Department of Ed. So nobody is uh, and I think Dave would uh, concur with this, that there's no one uh, identifying their own particular cost centers and m having their own definition. It is identified as a standard by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. And so when you put expenditures and salaries and wages by cost center, it gives you the true picture for what that is, that particular function uh, costs. For example, uh, the business office. It has supplies, uh, uh, copy machines, and so forth and so on. That's one aspect of the cost of that uh, cost center that, or that office. But the salaries certainly are a major part of that. Uh, professional development uh, is another one. There's a salary component to that. So it gives you a truer picture of the cost for that function or cost center uh, when you add when you have both expen have both expenditures and wages and salaries as well <coughs> the the only a comment I, the only comment I would have is um, going back to the cost center it, 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 it can get murky when you think about how to attribute people's time and effort right it's relative to need exactly so for example so if you consider right, me you could charge me to the business office but historically i could also get a portion of my time could get charged to facilities um a portion of my time could get charged to special education so then it gets a little bit murky with you know a teacher defined as a special education teacher is a clear probably delegation however um if someone acts or takes additional time to act as a power for one of those periods, it gets a little foggy. So yes, the end of year report is clearly the best way that it's done. Everyone's information, every every article, every cent that we put in there is attributed to the end of year report. There's just got to be a way to uh, sort that in, in, a, in a way that uh, provides kind of transparency that, that's necessary with excluding or doing the best you can to um, uh, merge, the, merge the apples and the oranges. Right, right. So, y again, y 
you could present something, it just may lead to a, a plethora of questions because of right. the information that you're pulling into that data. Yeah. So it, it's 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 possible. It just I think it's all should be messaged with a caveat that this is kind of our, our best best foot best effort to to defragment the apples and the oranges. Yeah, so we'll take a stab at looking at that, but I think um, it's always worthy of you know answering questions however people need them answered. Do you have another question about the budget? No, uh, just a comment, uh, and the comment is simply this, that um, obviously we've spent from uh, about middle August to now to come up with what you, what you have, which is in effect our standard uh, process for doing budgets. We also are obligated to provide the state in the time that they ask for the state standard information. And I would say that uh, I certainly, as a member of the school committee, wouldn't suggest that we do anything different than the state standard information that you've asked for. Uh, to the extent that there's you know, some variation on that theme, I don't suggest we need to do that for the simple reason that uh, the information is there in line item budgets to the extent someone else wants to accumulate it and add it and subtract it, that's fine. But certainly we do have an obligation to put together the, the fall report in the format that's acceptable to the state. And I would say that's the standard that I would suggest we would do on behalf of yeah. anybody um, and, uh, and, and run with that. To the extent that beyond that, that there's something easily done, um, then we can try that. But for now, this is a massive project for us and for any other town department. And, um, you know, unless there's a logical sequence that gets us to your answer your question, then um, those are my comments on Yeah, no, on, I appreciate all theme. of that as we kind of move forward. And I probably imagine we're done with most of this for right now. But one of the things, if you think historically across my time here, something I think that's happened that's healthy is that the proper source to answer your question is Dave. <laughs> and so, like, you know, like we are the people to represent our own numbers. And one of the things that we struggled with over the years of really healthy process was we had people that were running multiple sheets where they were taking data and sorting it mm -hmm. and then representing it as the school information. And one of the things we said is that all the work we've done around good relationships is that if FIMCOM wants to see a database, we're gonna provide it because we know what's in it and we can explain it. And as the relative source of the understanding of a $64 million budget, should this come to pass, it's our responsibility to answer those questions. So I feel comfortable that there's a time and place where we say we've given you what information we can, we're not gonna sort it again, but I'd rather that we provide and, and are the, our own representative source of um, best knowledge. And I think that's something that everybody's bought into in a really healthy way. So that's why we've been able to have such healthy process. Um, and so we should be able to easily, you know, um, look at what they want informationally and provide some. Okay. Is anyone else here from our audience um, here to ask any questions about the budget? Any other questions from our committee? So I just want to thank Amber, Dave, and their team, and the Westboro leadership team for their strong work during this thorough budget process. We receive it with our magnifying glasses glued to the numbers, yet we also recognize that there are people behind these numbers, students, staff, and residents, affected by the budget put into motion. But we very much appreciate the work that you all do. So at this time, I would like to know if there's a motion to close the budget public hearing. So move. Do we have a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. There are five to zero in favor. The public hearing has now been closed. And we move on to our next agenda item. We will now continue with the school committee member reports. We'll begin with Steve Batchelor. Nothing to report. <laughs> Kristen Vincent. I have nothing tonight, thank you. Raghu Nandan. Nothing tonight, thanks. Steve, do you want to wait for the building update? Yes, please. And so I just want to thank the local businesses for the winter stroll event this past Sunday. It was excellent. I was able to make it to two toy stores, Play Now and Learning Express, Le Duc Antiques, Vivacity, I threw. Veg Out Food Truck, Sapporo, Sohope with Kim Tynan. 
the Borough Sugar Shack, where I also saw Amber Bach, <laughs> and Haiga Books. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that correctly. But seeing some of our neighbors in one place was amazing. And may I add that the lights in the downtown Westboro are impressive. They are Thank gorgeous. you to the residents who have donated to the Lights Fund, organized by the Rotary Club, Beautiful. for this impressive display of holiday cheer. Um, I also <coughs> wanted to thank Sarah DeLay, Maura Shani, and Maureen Johnson for their hard work in organizing and pulling off another exceptional turkey trot. <laughs> so we'll move right along to the, business, the, the building project update. Steve? Okay, well, um, as we talked about before, we're coming down to the final uh, efforts relative to the failed school. Uh, the, the building punch lists are basically complete. Um, the, uh, the remaining, let's call it project <coughs> effort, is the um, shade structure which will ship out of Wisconsin on the 13th of December. Um, it, it probably will be here um, uh, within a few days of that. Uh, it is anticipated that it will be erected before Christmas and that will take care of most of the outside projects. There are two other items that are in the works. One is to adjust the uh, the uh, black hole content in the uh, in the, uh, the geothermal well system, and the other is to get the recent work that happened uh, on Veterans Day uh, to install the uh, the meter that reads our solar generation, which, if you recall, in the past discussion was it's the basis under which we receive. Um, uh, our solar uh, renewable energy credits, which is larger than the, cr the energy credits that I mentioned in past uh, national grid bills because it records the total generation versus the grid bill uh, records the generation that's being ex um, exported. And the difference between the two, of course, is the energy we use in the school. So the solar recs are based on the total solar generation and that meter is important to get it straightened out and working. So the, uh, the, the, the meter was installed uh, on or about Veterans Day and maybe Friday instead. But uh, anyway, it's, uh, it's in the process now of uh, being uh, detailed and coming up with exactly whether it works the way it's supposed to and if not, what are we going to do about it? So th that's pretty much everything. Uh, one of the things that's kind of great is until we get snow, the grass is so green around the project <laughs> that it's finally nice to see versus all the brown that we saw for two and a half years. Uh, as far as other projects that are ongoing, there was a walkthrough by the architect relative to Fails, uh, excuse me, to um, Hastings recently, uh, which uh, provides uh, uh, opportunity for them to revisit all the things that they're up to and uh, move forward with the project for the, uh, the uh, hope that we'll have uh, bid documents by town meeting. And if not, certainly we will be able to do uh, something in the fall if necessary. So that's, that's the building update. Okay. So we'll move on right along to citizens' request. Um, is there anyone here tonight that wishes to make a statement to the school committee? Seeing none, we'll move on to our <laughs> next agenda item. Um, now for a capital planning update from Amber regarding her presentation to the Capital Planning Committee last week. My understanding, a long and productive meeting that allows for a strong planning cycle sorted and mapped out for how to rotate projects forward. And Steve Durrett also serves on this committee, so he may add some insights as well. Well, the good news I don't have to based on this budget. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's, it's Amber's to, to explain. Yes. Yeah, so a really, sh I think collaborative, uh, you know, we're always, like, many brains are better than one, right? So I think what I would really recognize is that it felt really good to go to the Capitol Committee uh, with David and Kelly G. Capella, myself, to present the Capitol uh, proposal and what ensued was a very thoughtful conversation where everyone on that committee really dug in and wanted to begin to recognize what was the strategic approach that we had to have to leverage multiple large projects and so what evolved was I think a really nice clarity that the 10-year cycle needed to break down large projects into 
one year of design request followed by the next year of approval. So I'm going to take one example and then I'll show you how this works. We went initially with a proposal for, I'll take the mill pond roof where we were going to do that seal coating of, at 1.1 million to provide a 20 year extension on the life of that roof. And then what we recognized was that the way you actually want to manage that is you want to request this year, not for the actual roof, you want to request the 132,000, which is 12% rough order of magnitude for design. And then the following year in 25, you see the 1.1 million there in the column as a placeholder rough order of magnitude. And yet before that gets finalized, you would have your design where you could go out to bid and come in with a hard number so that your request in 25 is carrying everything you need in the request and then that number would be amended. And it responds to the issues we've faced with escalations in costs, problems where when we have come forward after utilizing a rough order of magnitude, we have a voted amount at town meeting that then doesn't cover all expenditures needed. And so we went back to the drawing board after an extensive conversation and we modified our proposals and divided them into design and then implementation and created a rotation. So you see for next year, we are requesting design for the Hastings roof, the whole Hastings roof, and the following year carrying the 4.2 million. When we went initially to the Capitol Committee, we were carrying the roof. And we talked about instead of doing that 4.2 million, we would start with design, place hold into 25, the 4.2 million, and then adjust that number based upon what we get in the bid from that design. The other number you see was then added, and it's in yellow. And Hastings has been such a complex project. I just want to give a really a nice shout out to Ian Johnson as somebody who has years and years of experience and tracks these projects as closely as we do in paying attention as a steward of a select board member that needs to kind of understand all of this. And so he had said, wait a minute, we really need to put in a core placeholder for the ADA construction because we're currently out to design. So we went to fall town meeting and we got the design, the expansion of the warrant article of Monday's existing to include design for the ADA. Because we didn't want to have a rough order of magnitude placeholder because that's failed us before, we didn't submit it. But it led to this beautiful conversation where we were like, wait a minute, but you are out for design. We're going to carry a placeholder for now and prior to town meeting, crack a bid that will allow us to have that $5 million adjusted to an accurate biddable document number. So right now the timeline as an example so we added the five million dollar rough order of magnitude placeholder and that was the number that was discussed at the meeting and it is simply to hold it in the rotation i actually think it will be less than that based upon um, there's funding existing already uh, almost at a at about 3.8 million of hvac money and now we'll get the additional design finalization of HVAC and the ADA and come in with a cracked bid with a number for those that will allow us to adjust that five million uh, in the motion at town meeting. So the rotation now slots out beautifully and I, I just want to say beautifully one more time because I feel like managing the capital process collaboratively Kim Foster working with the committee and Steve as a member and then Ian and other members as well um, Lisa uh, uh, Blazewski I always say her name incorrectly I apologize uh, was like wait a minute I get it like she was like this is what you should do and she kind of started manipulating the numbers because she then kind of clicked for her like this makes complete sense and so 
the collaboration in that is half the battle of really managing all of these large numbers. These are ours, and now the town's numbers mesh with that such that we can develop a town process for, for the rotation of capital funding. Um, so this document gives you, a, I think, a very clean summation. This is Kim Foster's document. So clearly she tracked all the discussions because she's like wrapped this up beautifully. And she has one of these for each of the major departments that submit. And then I provided for you the um, redrafted um, sheets on each item, which Kelly G. Capella did a really nice job um, pulling together such that it represents this rotation. I would encourage you to look at those sheets and you can see how they've been revised. I think Kelly made a really astute decision that it's kind of confusing to separate the design and the rough order of magnitude, so she put them into one um, doc and it reads really clearly. And so I, that's the kind of leadership you're looking for. She's like, I think this is more clear. I'm like, that's what your job is, is to make it clear. So she did a really nice job to amend that and I think we're bringing forward really strong documents. So I feel really good about the process. I think Steve does as well. Um, and we'll see what gets, you know, how all the funding works out. But the committee felt that what we were proposing now is in line with what makes sense. Questions. I don't really have to do them tonight. This is a long-standing process. I guess I would ask you to look at them, email me questions. You already approved the options for us to bring forward these projects. So there's no additional approval needed. I think it's acknowledging that that committee is in charge of allocations working with us. And so that's kind of what we left the meeting with was these anticipated adjustments and then hopefully they would fund all of those in the package of capital. Steve? Actually, I do have some comments, but not specifically on this. I think it's more the background. How we got to the need to do this is that, um, first of all, Mass General Laws requires above a certain dollar amount of a project that, in fact, we have an engineer and do engineering work, create specifications and a bid document. So to the extent that as you see in all these projects, they're monstrous in regards to what we used to be able to spend money on and, and actually afford in the town. So the issue here is that because they do th cross that threshold and we know that we have to hire an engineer in the first place in order to get the stuff we need, um, it sort of makes sense to segregate it into this methodology. The second piece that caught us uh, and would continue to catch us is that if we underestimate what the project cost is going to be that based on the rules of town meeting that we can't increase the dollar amount from the warrant published number any more than 10 percent so process wise we need to have the number you know that accurate you know um, so 100 percent bid which is bid on the basis of a fixed price contract means that if we schedule it correctly and we get the bid price in within 30 days of the town meeting, whichever one it is, uh, then we know exactly what the total project cost is going to be based on the contract. And to the extent that, let's say, a contract has uh, extras and, uh, with a sufficient contingency in the number, we should be able to come back to town meeting with a real number. Uh, that doesn't need to be violated. Exactly, and I think, I mean, good point. I think that the fact that you're carrying it at a higher number that, you know, you anticipate with a bid would come down, it would be, you've built in that safety. Because you can't go over, which, you know, when I was talking the number three with Steve, was like, that's a good hold, and then the cracked bid will probably lower that number. So keep in mind what we found out between January and, um, when was it, I guess, uh, somewhere around, no, it was after town meeting. So January to, to say April, we found that the numbers that we were trying to use for the Armstrong roof were radically different. And so as a result of that, the argument was, we need to do it now. Uh, we need to do it with a, with a real bid, which we actually, based on the cooperation of everybody in town, were able to get in time in order to get the funding for it uh, within the auspices of the Board of Selectmen's um, um, award, I guess you might say. So the bottom line on is that when we used that process, we were good to go. And I think that's the, uh, that's the example that 
really justifies this discussion that Amber um, related in regards to the capital expenditures committee. So I think it will not only work for us, but it'll work for other parts of the town as well. Um, and they're subject to the same mass uh, bid laws as we are. Steve? Yeah, I, I think this is a really smart move. Um, I just had a, a specific question, the order of magnitude. H how is that calculated for each particular uh, item here? You mean the rough, oh, so. Yeah, the um, rough order of magnitude. You tend to get those, we get those from the architects, the design people, the engineers who come on site to give you cost estimates and typically they do, they, they assess the project, they use current uh, okay, so it's an know. ex. So it's a number coming from it's outside. Not it's not it just. Yeah, yeah, no, no, <laughs> okay. It, 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 unfortunately, it's not the real number you're going to have to pay. Right. Yeah. That I. But it's I, not generated by us. For example, um, pieces of work you've seen. You've seen the roof estimates that come in, and Garland can come in and yeah. do a general assessment. Look at what we have. Do that walk down. Compare it to. to current roofing costs in the industry and give us a rough order magnitude okay. and a general scope of anticipated work. And then when you go to design, that's when you get it literally down to a document you put out to bid. Right. But that rough order magnitude comes from that type of kind of overview. Okay. So we're going to move right along to our next agenda item. Uh, thank you, Steve and Amber, for your hard work on that. Um, our next item is a discussion about a subcommittee on school committee policies. There are a number of policies that Massachusetts Association of School Committees has recommended to be updated, and therefore I'm looking to form a subcommittee to review school committee policy updates. Um, the subcommittee would then make recommendations to the full committee. I'd be willing to be on this subcommittee unless there's a mad dash to be on it. <laughs> But I do think adding a second school committee member and an administrator such as Andrea Macknick, who typically keeps track of the mask uh, recommendations, that makes sense. And I think, um, additionally, knowing that uh, Steve Batchelor has a strength in reading policies in general, I would think he'd make a great asset a member of this committee. And therefore, I'd like to recommend him. But I'd like thoughts from the committee, uh, from the school committee. I guess my first thought is uh, ultimately it's the committee chair that decides these things. And so other than recommendations to you, I think it's pretty clear what might happen here. <laughs> Unless you really want to be on it. Uh, no, I'm, I'm pretty well booked up with what's going on now. Yeah. Ragu, Ragu, you're feeling, you know. Uh, good. <laughs> <laughs> you're not thinking policy committee. Do you feel it okay about this one? Yeah, oh yeah. Okay. It's a great um, opportunity to get, like you say, like you look at the budget here and there, like you get into policy, you get a chance to kind of just go to that next deeper level of, of information and it, it works really well to start to rotate onto a couple key committees. That feels good. And okay. one of the interesting things about something like that is that you, you get at some point in time to deal with school council. And uh, uh, I'll tell you in my own experience, based on all the things that we've done on the school committee, that that is really beneficial because it gives you a totally different concept of the way you think about these things. And it's amazing how many, let's call them corrections, I guess, that have been offered to the school committee by virtue of discussion with council. Um, yeah. It is expensive, but it's, it's generally well worth what it costs the town. And Andrea, I just have to give a shout out to my assistant, Andrea Macknick, who is incredibly vigilant around reading them in depth, marking up the line item changes, and bringing you document comparisons so you can understand what needs to be discussed. And she maintains them and then brings them to the chair and says, like, you've got a package of things you need to look at. And so that's the process we use. So you're not going to be swimming through hundreds of pages of documents. You're going to look at a lot of documents, but they're, they're, they're guided for you. Who's doing the shepherding for yeah. me? Yes, <laughs> yes. Oh so boy. I think we need a motion to approve the school committee policies subcommittee with uh, myself and Steve Batchelor and Andrea Macknick. So move. Do we have a second? I'll second. second. <laughs> One of them. <laughs> We'll give it to Kristen. Okay. 
Um, is there any more discussion? All those in favor? Aye. We have a five to zero vote in favor of this subcommittee. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. That passes, five being present. Um, well, for some reason we're ahead of schedule after going behind a little bit there, but well worth our <laughs> expansion about the budget, which really is probably the most important <laughs> item we had tonight. Um, so, our next regular session meeting of the school committee is scheduled for Wednesday, December 14th, 2022. Do we have a motion to adjourn this meeting of the school committee? So moved. Do we have a second? Second. Any discussion about <laughs> adjourning? <laughs> Everyone starts on the uh, yeah. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Five to zero. Yeah. This meeting uh, is oh, yeah. adjourned. Yeah, yeah exactly. Ordered. Yeah. <laughs>